language. Sissy, you know how I should regard in this issue. Jack is so very serious. Sometimes I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gratitude to me is one to be commended for one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one with a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that's why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecil, I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthen has many troubles in his life. I draw moments and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. I'm afraid that if I don't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it's usually chronicle things that never happened, and never possibly could have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for all three volume novels that we have. Do not speak slightingly of the three volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. The good ended happily and the bad end happily. That's what fiction means. I suppose so. Was your novel ever published, Miss Prism? Alas, no. The manuscript was abandoned. I use the term in a sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. this morning. Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her the world of good for a stroll through the park, Dr. Chazzy Boy. Cecily, I've not mentioned anything about a headache. Yes, but I felt instinctively that you did. And I was thinking about that and not my German work when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not being inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. But I am fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil. I would hang upon her lips. I spoke metaphorically. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet. I do not expect him on Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He's not one of those who sold in his enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man's brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A uh, classical illusionary, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at evening song. I think, dear Doctor, I will come ashore with you. I'll find out a headache after all, and the walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Brittany. With pleasure. We might go as far as schools and back. That would be delightful. Certainly, you will read your political economy in my absence. Horrid <coughs> political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German! <coughs> and Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing? Uncle Jack's brother? Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned to him that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He wishes to speak to you urgently for a moment. Send Mr. Ernest Worthing here. Yes, miss. I've never met a truly wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm afraid he will look just like everyone else. He does. Your man is your cousin Cecily, I'm sure. Your arms are strange to say. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. And you, I believe, are my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, you mustn't think I'm wicked. I'm really not wicked, cousin Cecily. Then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. Oh, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. Now that you mention it, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be proud of that, although it must have been quite pleasant. It's much pleasanter being here with you, Cecily. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back until Monday afternoon. Oh, that's a shame. I have an appointment on Monday morning that I'm anxious to miss in London. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment's in London. Still, I think you should wait until Uncle Jack gets back. I know he wants to talk to you about your emigrating. About my what? About your emigrating. He's going to have to buy your outfit. Oh, I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy any of my outfits. He has no taste in neckties at all. I 
don't think you'll need neckties. Uncle Jack sent me to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. He said it did not want to leave him, that you'd have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Well, all the accounts I've heard of Australia and the next world aren't particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that sensitive. That's why I want you to reform me. Make that your mission, if you will. Oh, I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all the books were snare. <clears throat> a snare that every sensible man would want to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I should care to catch a sensible man. We wouldn't have anything to talk about. Dining room? 
I don't know what it all means. I think it's perfectly absurd. Good heavens! Brother John, I've come <laughs> all the way down from town to say that I'm very sorry for the life I've been lived. I'm going to try and make it up to you in the future. Uncle Dad, do be nice. If you do not shake your brother's hand, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. <laughs> it's pleasant, is it not, to see such perfect reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you'll come with us. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. It's not with poetry or in our judgment. I see a <laughs> How do you young scoundrel just get off of this place as soon as possible? Turn to our other flower and he's bumbling here. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose this is all right. What? Mr. Ernest Worthing's luggage, sir. I have packed it and placed it into the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. Mary, I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. <laughs> <laughs> Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful lie you are, Jack. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my uh, pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You're not to talk of Miss Carvey like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. It's horrible to stay in mourning for a man who's in fact staying a whole week at your house. <laughs> You're not staying with me for a week or anything else. You've got to leave by the 4 5 train. I'm not leaving. You would stay with me, I suppose. It'd be most distasteful if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you're not too long. I've never seen so much, someone take so long to dress with just a little result. Well, at any rate, that's better than being always overdressed as you are. If I'm a little overdressed, I make up for it by being immensely overeducated. <laughs> your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct and outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you've got to leave by the 4-5 train, and I hope you'll have a pleasant journey back to town. This bombing, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. I think it's been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that's their reason. But I must see her again before I go. Make arrangements for another family. Ah, there she is. Oh, I merely came back to water the roses. I thought she was Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he taking you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It's always painful parting from people whom one has known for such a brief space of time. <coughs> the dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Mary Man, for five minutes. Yes, miss. Cecily, I hope you shall not offend you by stating quite openly and frankly that you appear to me to be the physical personification of absolute perfection. I think your father says you great credit, Ernest. If you don't mind, I would like to copy your remarks into my diary. You keep a diary? I keep anything from a look at it. May I? Oh no, you couldn't possibly. You see, it is the thoughts and impressions of a young girl, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, don't stop, Ernest. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell cough. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think you should say you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopeless doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Yes, <clears throat> The drug cart is waiting, sir. I had to come round next week at the same hour. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he found out you were staying on till next week at the same hour. I don't care for Jack. I don't care for anybody in the world but you. I love you, Cecily. Will you marry me? You silly boy. We've been engaged for the last three months. Three months? 
Yes, it will be three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who had a very wicked life, he, he of course formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prison, and one who is most talked about is often very attractive. One thinks there must be something in him, and I dare say it's foolish of me, Ernest, but I fell in love with you. Darling, but when was our engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last, worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, and after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you. The following day, I bought this ring in your name, and this is the bangle with the two lovers knots I promised you always to wear. Did I buy you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Oh yes, you wonderful good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I always gave you for leading such a terrible life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. But, my sweet Cecily, I never wrote you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well I was forced to write yours for you. I wrote three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Diary. 